So I find it interesting, as you will, that just when human beings need the information to survive themselves, it's there. It's there. And it's hidden in the, the now very clear evolutionary timeline of our species. We are here to shine a light on that, and the data is there for us to learn about ourselves for the first time. Self-discovery for the entire human species to determine a couple of interesting things. Here it is. We're not flawed in any way, and I'd better be able to come up with something good to back that up. Well, I think I can. What's easier for Mary Lou to hear? We're flawed? Or we are gravely injured and emotionally exhausted beings. This is the Play Your Position podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to another episode of the Play Your Position podcast, where we discuss things relevant to being a better leader and how we can all show up to this game called life with more skills so that we get more out of what we do personally and professionally. Today is no exception. I have a fantastic guest who is going to knock your socks off with what he is up to in the world. His name is Tony Wall. Tony, are you ready for kickoff? I am pleased to be here and very ready. Thank you. Yes. So Anthony Wall is the founder and president of Noesis, a nonprofit dedicated to issues of human sustainability, to examine evolutionary influence upon modern behavior, and to one day free humankind from the churn of perpetual conflict. Wall, who comes from a family of nine, graduated from the William Penn Charter School in Philadelphia. He then moved on to Chicago, where he graduated from Lake Forest College. Wall credits his liberal arts education as the catalyst for his ongoing interest in existential philosophy. He spent two decades of his career in the financial services industry and found himself always drawn back to the study of humankind. So in 2019, Wall established Noesis. He created a series of educational videos to describe the immensity of evolutionary influence upon modern behavior. Wall describes a notable paradox, the primitive compulsions that keep evolving humans safe now combine to block humanity's arrival into a sustainable future. So, Tony, this kind of work that you're doing is absolutely fascinating to me and I think is going to be uh, fascinating to listeners. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of what you are doing in the world with Noesis, could you tell us your story of when you got the call to leadership? Obviously, I said in 2019 when you founded Noesis, but it might go back, you know, years before that. I don't know. Just tell us. When did you get that call and how has it shaped your work and the life that you lead? Uh, thank you, Mary Lou. First of all, it's, it's a, again, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I enjoy the privilege of talking about what I do. Um, we started out in 2019, as you say. I come from a, a, a large family, uh, three of nine children. We were in a suburban neighborhood. I, I a very fortuitous childhood, wonderful friends, um, colonial homes, uh, loving relatives. We didn't have any money, but we never wanted for anything. You know, I come from that type of a background where, where we I had a terrific childhood, first of all. That's, I think it's a great start to anyone's life. I, mm-hmm. I, I look back on that with, was as extremely fortuitous. And everything after that, that happened, would itself be fortuitous coming off of a launching pad of a, of, a, of a nice childhood. So, but even as a young man, I was taken to observation. I was always drawn to the observation of things around me 
uh, trying to make sense of them as opposed to judging or blaming them. So I'm an observer uh, first and foremost, and the ob- observation of my uh, of my environment allow me to step away and divorce myself from the emotions that might cloud my judgment as to actually what's going on in front of me. And also something else is true too. I always had trouble with the pain of others. And let me put it that way. The pain of others was always something that was more painful for me in many Mm, mm -hmm. times. So so I, I came up that way, but I came to understand Apparently, I don't call myself this, but somebody t- tapped me on the shoulder one day and said, don't look now, you're an empath. Oh. Um, so is this anything special? No, no. Empaths are very, very, very common. But that made a lot of sense to me now where I could be comfortable with what my default was. And that was to examining my environment with divorced from judging or blaming it. And, and that's what really... That would bring Noesis to life years later. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, you know, the being an empath is, I think more people know what that is now because of the internet. And um, there's there's been a lot of uh, articles written about the need for empathic leaders, people who are able to do what you do, step away from the emotions and really just look at what's going on. Noesis was born from, as I read in your intro, you went to a liberal arts college. You were, were drawn to hu- humanitarian type conversations. I mean, if you're into uh, existential philosophy, <laughs> you know, that's all about meaning of life and, you know, why are we here and what can we do? So talk about, if Noesis is what, three years old now, so it's still young. How are you leading humankind through the work you do in Noesis. Let's get into what this kind of work is and why it matters. Okay. Um, first of all, it, we started in 2018. We came into being officially early 2019. So I want to make a point here. Uh, we, we, we handle, we tackle issues of sustainability, hum, human state sustainability. Um, and let me put this out here to make people vaguely uncomfortable with a promise that they will not feel so by the end. Mm. And that is this, Uh, the human species is not sustainable in any discernible way. And and through my work, never mind what I say, it's only about what we could show. And what we will show is that the models all around us right now have always been in place for human cultures and have always eventually collapsed all human cultures. So we're dealing with, it occurred to me very, very quickly that we were dealing with some type of a constant that we needed to get busy fighting, and we did. But let's go back to existential philosophy. I don't want to assign that too big of a of a station. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Existential philosophy gets, you know, is overthought. You know, what it really means, what it really asks us to do is to examine the world around us with an un blinking lens. You know, look at the world ex- with extremely ob- in, in an objective way to determine what's happening in front of you to be able to to be able to understand your environment in a way that you can bring a process to bear upon changing an environment that has no utility or that has f- harm. So let me explain something about what we do here at Noesis. We are here to explain to human beings that everything we do in the modern day, everything has an evolutionary trigger. We therefore are overwhelmed every day. All of us makes us human. We're overwhelmed by impulses and compulsions that activate many times faster than thinking than the thinking brain. So with, with that inarguable constant in place, we're able to deduce that, that we're overwhelmed and overmatched by our own evolutionary past as we now attempt to move into a sustainable future. So here we are chained to our evolutionary past, unable therefore to find our future. 
Mm. Could you clarify what it means to be chained to our evolutionary past? I, I still hear people today talk about, oh, when we were running away from the saber-toothed tigers and and we haven't had saber-toothed tigers in millennia. <laughs> You know, is that what you're talking about, or is it something bigger or something different? No, you are a good work by you, and I mean that. You will see why. The saber tooth tigers do not exist anymore for us. Neither do any of the other dangers that we continue to look for in areas of the brain not available to us. Yeah, we are having, uh, with all respect, we are experiencing evolutionary hallucinations every day, all day. Mm. Mm. It means that we, and again, by extension, it's no longer a cell of any kind that we're misinterpreting our environments. So when we misinterpret our environment right away, threats will be misinterpreted. And we will then act in a way that is misaligned with the actual threat in front of us. That explains the calamities we see all around us. That explains the default to perpetual conflict, something going on that can now be greatly understood and viewed every day, all day by all your viewers will never, ever see it the same. You'll never be able to unsee it once you see it. Can you give an example of something that viewers might recognize for themselves where that's happened to them? Oh, yes. Uh, Let me give you a, a, a really, really big one. Uh, what value do we bring by explaining that human beings may be uh, selecting themselves uh, for their own demise, that our human mortality is vaguely visible on the horizon, which is a very reasonable way to put it. What could we impart to humans that would give them a hint of what we have to offer here? Here's something big. Would it be worth something to 8 billion human beings, all of whom come from the same place? And that is the central African plains, the African kind of a basin. That's no longer a conjecture. We are clinical brothers and sisters, in fact. Would it be worth something to know that everything we see around us, we are looking for anything negative. We, we identify what's wrong and we get busy pounding on it, don't we? We sure do. Um, that, again, is a very easy thing for every one of your listeners to own right away. I can get everybody on the same page now. With them on the same page, watch how easy this is. We are misinterpreting our environments. And the reason why we look for and isolate what's wrong is because that helped us to survive as we evolved. The bearer of bad news had way more value to our people than the bearer of good news. Hmm. And nobody would be expected to understand that. We're here to understand and impart information like this that can help human beings to deduce the uselessness of these behaviors in the modern day. But we caution, and correctly, we caution that we've monetized these defaults. So far from changing anything, no, step one, notice it. <clears throat> As a, so let me give you a little bit more. Again, I'm going to draw a big, big picture here. Every single time that you see someone picking out what's wrong and ignoring the ocean of what's right, you're watching them look for negative information for the tribes that stopped existing eons ago. Huh. We need to understand that we are, in fact, answering ancient bells. And that's no, again, no longer, no biggest, uh, it's not a big sell. Well, here's another example of how easy it is to sell now. It's, it's this, human beings we call ourselves blank slates at birth. Oh no, 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not even, uh-huh. not even close, uh, Mary Lou. In fact, we have about uh, we have about anywhere from sixty to seventy five thousand prior generations of human beings wound into our DNA the moment we're born. Yeah. Are are we a blank slate as far as the 
computer that we carry in our head for everyday events? Yes. However, we are saddled. We are saddled with millions of years of impulses and compulsions, mostly defensive in nature, that never got the memo when their ancient enemies died. Mm -hmm. So how easy, rather than this big brain on Tony and Noesis, no. Did I just break new ground or did I just point out the nose on our face? So, so there's no blame or judgment here. We're here to explain to humans who have deduced that we are flawed and explain to us, no, we're not. No, we're not. We are saddled with the immense weight of an evolutionary past that we could never, ever, ever understand, but that we can now understand in great detail. And I don't know, I would suggest we get busy. Get busy doing what? Like, what can we do, listeners now, know, hearing what your statements and saying, okay, so that world no longer exists. And yet I'm still knee-jerk reaction, reacting to the negativity. I don't want to do that anymore because obviously that's not, that's not helping anything. It's just, it's keeping me where I'm, I am or maybe even send, setting me back. So when you work with people... When you're working, you know, to educate, what can we do differently? Where do you even begin to unravel this predilection for the negative? Yeah, it's immense. It's the immense. immense. How, how do you, how do you, how do we unravel what is so immense? Yeah. Great question. And I'm happy to surprise you here. We, uh, it, it took us four years to be, four years to determine that we were ready for a world because if you're going to come out with human sustainability, you do real good not to be full of baloney because you're going to, everybody's going to hit the exits and I'm going to be right behind them. Mm-hmm. So, so we are fact-based, Barry Lou. Um, the, the most that we will risk is what stands to reason on its worst day. So what can we do today? Well, I'm going to surprise you to the downside here. But again, I don't bring value of any kind by soft pedaling these issues. Here it is. I say to people, we can notice what I just explained about negative information. We can notice it. And you, everybody's going to say, gee, that's not enough. We need something we can do. And I must respectfully and firmly put the hand up and say, no, let me explain how important noticing is. Every single person that's listening Tomorrow, today, every day of their lives, we will solve problems. We will see clarity on many, many things. And the first problem, the first thing we do when we assess a problem is we notice it. We notice every problem or we cannot get busy solving it. It would appear that noticing is central and to, to everything. So if is Tony saying like, well, we could notice it now and that's all? Oh, no, no. It will change how you look at everything. Again, once we see it, what I'm going to explain to you, once we see it, we'll never unsee it. I'm going to ask people to sit back, divorce themselves from their emotions, divorce themselves from the knee-jerk need to blame everything on everyone and to not take any blame ourselves and sit back from it and observe it, observe it. And again, the, your surroundings will never, ever look the same. The stars will align on so many things. What we think we're saying is not what we're saying. We see human beings at one another's throats more than ever, and we're scared. But we need not be, because here's what's going on. We are seeing the choice of existential fear has always chosen safety in numbers. So we look around and we see a landscape where us versus them has never been more prevalent. And we end there. Like, what's going on? Everything's falling apart. No, we're acting naturally. Fear chooses safety in numbers. Are we arguing politics like bandits 
or are we seeking safety because of increasing existential fear? We think it's the latter. So right there is two things people can understand. Number one, we're beating one another about the head over political issues. I just call them existential fear manifestation. Now, that's a whole new different way to look at it. Yeah, it's a paradigm shift. It's, you know what, thank you very much. I would never use that because like you, you're, you would probably say to me, well, tell me that's a horrible cliche. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it's, we're asking people to understand that what's in front of them is not what they think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's not even close. Why? Because again, everything we do has an evolutionary trigger. We can understand what they are. Now, we have a late, a spotlight on the evolutionary timeline of the human species that is extremely detailed, where even 50 years ago it was not so. Mm -hmm. So I find it interesting, as you will, that just when human beings need the information to survive themselves, it's there. It's there. And it's hidden in the, the, the now very clear uh, evolutionary timeline of our species. We are here to shine a light on that. And the data is there for us to learn about ourselves for the first time. Mm. Self-discovery for the entire human species to determine a couple of interesting things. Here it is. We're not flawed in any way. And I better be able to come up with something good to back that up. (laughs) Well, I think I can. What's easier for Mary Lou to hear? We're flawed or we are gravely injured and emotionally exhausted beings? Oh, easier to hear is we're flawed. It's an empathic take, but it's also factual. Why do I say factual? Again, I better be able to back it up. Here's what, what's going on here. Human beings have collaboration and cooperation in our DNA. It was forged through 275,000 years of human migration that started in the African Congo Basin. It took us 275,000 years to get to all areas of the globe. And if we were not in tightly bound groups, we risked our very lives. This was not a casual need to assist and to be assisted, to help what is helpless. No. It's wound around our bones. This peaceful, loving, integrated being met head on with a random, random event. Where's the blame here? It's random. You know, uh, natural selection is random. So what happened to us? Well, we got to all areas of the, uh, of the globe. And um, where did we have, what did we... Where was there to go? So we naturally settled down into larger and larger populations. And stationary humans were the new reality coming off of migratory humans. Mm. Now, stationary is where the trouble begins. I don't mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't mean to be in any cryptic. I'm going to take you straight to it. And again, I'm going to say, once you see it, you'll never unsee it. Can't unring the bell. It's the stationary human being that ran into trouble relative to our migratory DNA, relatively speaking. The the behavior of stationary beings would eventually arrive at behaviors of acquisition. Villages turn into towns, turn into cities, turn into eventually empires. This was aided by an agricultural awakening. We domesticated beasts of burden. We domesticated pack animals to manage our beasts of birth. Our population has got bigger. They got lazier. They got fatter. Elements of control were introduced for the first time as population control 101. Again, quite logical, quite logical. But then something not so funny happened. Accredited behavior will always devolve into the creation of greater and lesser beings. This was not only problematic, this broke the human heart. 
Mm. I, I maintain that it broke the human heart. This is an empathic Tony explaining to human beings that we have suffered, heretofore never seen, never diagnosed, and certainly never resolved psychic injury. And what was that event that caused that? The s- settling down of human beings who were once migratory for 300,000 years into larger and larger populations. So stationary human beings and those dynamics are far different than the dynamics of migrating and collaborating human beings. Mm. The behaviors of acquisition, Mary Lou, would ask us to take up self-interest for the first time. Again, this is forensic in nature. Watch this. Self-interest and collaboration repel one another to a certain degree. Yeah. Again, we're not doing anything wrong. We were commanded to acquire for the first time. And this created lesser beings. A lesser being doesn't know what that means. In its DNA, it was meant to assist and to be assisted. Now, it was a lesser being. A broken heart ensued. Hmm. It would manifest as cruelty. It would manifest as resentment, which intruded for the first time on the human experience. Resentment, which then defaults mathematically to vengeance. Mm -hmm. Vengeance defaults mathematically to plotting insurgency. And that's what we've always seen. It's right in front of us. We're acting unnaturally relative to our peaceful, migratory, collaborative DNA. Does that sound like something we should beat ourselves up for? Or does that sound like something we need to understand in great detail? It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast. And we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. I'm wondering, I mean, is part of what Noesis the mission of Noesis is obviously to to teach so people gain this understanding. And then, you know, when you, one of my questions is always when you get out your metaphorical crystal ball, Tony, and you look ahead at five, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, I mean, do, is going back, is, is reintroducing the migratory elements of our species part of the answer or are... I mean, I hate to be fatalistic, but are we are we doomed? Is it too late? No. Oh, just thank you very much for asking that. I, I say that with, with utmost um, sincerity. Thank you. This is where I get a chance to greatly surprise everyone. We are remedial and hopeful here. We seek clarity for problem solving for human sustainability. The first thing we needed to do, and I just did it, was to not soft pedal these issues. We're up against realities that we can now greatly understand. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to migratory, where is there to go? We can't (laughs) do that. So we need to understand that the action reaction model today of perpetual conflict, it's an action reaction model. It was never a solution. We monetized our serial killer. We didn't know better. Mm -hmm. Again, these are children with matches. Do we scold them? No. We look at them with great empathy and we gently explain to them that this is, we're going to show that that why this might end poorly as opposed to what's the matter with you children? What's the matter with you all? That brings... Nobody wants to be blamed. Nobody wants to be lectured. We don't respond to blame. It's a threat to the human Mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. But somebody figured long ago that this brings cash registers. So in the right (laughs) in the mother of paradox, we have in fact monetized a known killer of human 
cultures. Let me add something here. Why is it important for noesis to exist or a noesis-like entity? Well, we're examining why we do what we do. Other, um, other efforts at human sustainability are noble ones. They exist in a future where we would bring climate change, pandemic, nuclear, uh, disruptive t- technologies. We would bring these out of control. And when we do, without something like Noesis to examine who we are, then, then we will find with our horror that we fixed everything but our very nature. Which can ultimately be our downfall. Not only just our downfall, but what we don't understand, we must evolve into. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That oof. What puts us yes. to conflict can now be greatly understood. And this is really, really big, really big. The only choice for a sentient species is capitalism. Mm. So capitalism is not going anywhere. But if you show me a lesser being or a diminished being of any kind, I will show you a constant breakdown into collapse. There will be no exceptions. Lesser beings are in no mood, Mary Lou. No mood. Why? It's not in our DNA. We don't know what to do with it. Mm. We will not sit still for it. So if somebody comes to me and says, Luke, you guys are full of baloney, beat it. I will say, thank you very much for listening. I will now leave. However, you have committed to a socio-mathematical constant that we have named and that we can now greatly understand. It means that all human cultures ever to come into being began to look like the old ones and quickly, Mary Lou. Mm -hmm. We think we were making choices, but we never were. What's truer? that we were making choices or that we were putting on the same play only with different actors. Yeah, well, you know, I'm also a product of a liberal arts background and I taught the humanities, you know, for lack of a better term, um, at both secondary and post-secondary levels. And, you know, I was an English teacher. So we read great works of art written by, all, you know, a variety of folks. And certainly there's the tried and true, but... I also emphasize a lot of self-reflection and self-observation. And when we studied transcendentalism, for example, and we looked at thinkers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, who were questioning the times that in which they existed and some of the the moral dilemmas and, you know, on and on and on, not to beat beat this horse. For me, you know, I I have a bent towards humanitarian issues and, and, and I, The answers already exist. The answers to the problems that we face are already here. We just haven't, to use your terminology, noticed them yet. And that is exciting to me that your organization is dedicated to helping people start with that very first step is just spend some time noticing. Uh, Thank you for understanding the weight of that first step. Why? We are not speedboats. No. We are. We, we will turn the human <laughs> vessel like an aircraft carrier in the water or we, nothing we do will set in. Remember, yeah. remember, we are overwhelmed out of the gate by our own evolutionary compulsions. Too many to count, too heavy to defeat. When, so in the, in the most literal of ways, uh, the starting gun we use kills our horse. Mm. And how do we ever intend to get to the finish line called human sustainability when we kill our horse out of the gate? Right. So what we can do now is greatly understand these mechanisms. We've banished our deepest and darkest compulsions to the basement. However, they remain there unchained. They want out. And when they get out, and it is, uh, it's going to happen every time, they are making the rules. Mary Jo. Did I just call you the wrong name? It's Mary Jo, right? <laughs> it's Mary Lou. <laughs> Mary Lou, sorry about that. At least I it's call okay. myself. <laughs> yeah, at least I call myself. I'm thankful for that. So let me explain again, going into our, our past. If 
a tornado. I'm an analogy and a metaphor guy. It helps. If a tornado blows by, everybody gets busy looking for survivors. There are no exceptions. If we hear a voice under the rubble, we don't blame that voice. We get busy stripping away multiple layers of rubble to save them. Mm -hmm. Similarly, human beings are buried under the rubble of 55,000 prior generations before us that fought enemies that long ago perished. So we need to view that being as one that has no business even trying to defeat a weightlifter. No weightlifter is going to lift 10,000 pounds. Uh, Mary Lou, they're going to explode. It's just too much. Right. Similarly, we cannot get out from under our own rubble. And here we are trying to attain sustainability with that truth. We can't even move around to do it. We're buried, but we can understand ourselves now. We can understand the rubble under which we're buried. We can strip it away. Mm -hmm. We can determine what is driving human behavior and deduce its uselessness in the modern day. We can also align ourselves with the threats in front of us. Right now, we're misinterpreting them, and our responses are therefore cartoon like. Because we don't understand what we're looking at. Mm. So give you mentioned climate change. Obviously, in the United States right now, one of the big perceived threats has to do with access to guns, you know. And what I'm hearing you say is that the we're looking at it all wrong. We're looking at the I hate please, I, I hate overly simplistic things. People say yeah. overly simplistic. No, I'm gonna counter with that, Mary Lou. I'm gonna call this precise. If if I was commenting on, if you had a cold and I kept commenting on uh, your, your slight cough and your sniffles and, and, your, and your fever, I'm not going to do you much good. I'm right. Gonna, I'm going to concentrate on your cold. You need to get into bed. You need to put take care of yourself. You need to bring a process to bear upon your cold. Yes. Okay. This is what we're doing here. We can now understand ourselves in great detail, not casual detail, great detail. A window of self-discovery opening up when we need it. I find that more than interesting. Okay, more than interesting. We have powers of reason and we are they are now beckoning us to in fact reason to determine how we got to this awful place with data we now have in spades, if the, it, it could be likened no, to no less than a vast field of crops, why we do what we do. Okay, so climate change doesn't happen to a being that understands that 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we need to preserve ourselves. Are we worth it? You tell me. Is it what we've become is not survivable in any way? What we are, peaceful, loving, collaborative beings, darn well deserves to survive. Mm -hmm. That's what's calling to us now to save it, to preserve it. It's when we as help what is helpless, all of us have the same warmth that flows over us like water. It's not incidental, it's biology. We're meant to do this. We now have a tug of, of, of an inquisitive model that won't allow us to look up, except for, again, a not so funny thing just recently happened. In the last 20, 30 years, we've only now looked up and realized the totality of our madness. I use the word hour. Do you hear blame there? Do you hear judgment? There is none. Why? It has no utility and problem solving and more than that. It doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So if a frightened child presented to us while we're walking around the mall, who among us would not drop what they're doing to reunite that child with their parents? Who among us? Nobody. Right. Well, there is a frightened, disconnected being 
who doesn't know how he got here and doesn't know how she's leaving right in front of us. And we're calling her flawed. Mm. We do not see cruelty here. We see broken hearts. Mm -hmm. That's a really, looking at those two lenses are so very different. So very different. We're in pain. Look, I don't big, want to be big time. I don't want yeah. to be melodramatic. Human beings are suffering the mm-hmm. hangover of an undiagnosed, un <laughs> heretofore never seen, and certainly yeah. never resolved injury. It happened when we crossed over from our deepest longings to assist and to be assisted over to the rigors of acquisition and the demands it would make. Where to a DNA that was not familiar with what I was looking at. Right. No, no diminished human being will ever, ever stand still for it. That guarantees the collapse of everything we'll ever do. There Mm. can only be necessary beings in a sustainable future, never lesser, ever. So that, that's not philosophy. That's math. Yeah. What's destroying the global human culture has always destroyed 70 prior human cultures in the same way. We get done with it. We start all over again. There's no logical flow to that. It means we don't understand ourselves in any way. And now we can. So really the, uh, the barrier here, from what I'm hearing, and obviously correct me if I don't say the right word here, but it, it's ignorance, not knowing. Not knowing. We, absolutely. But watch here. Watch what I do here. And there's no gimmicks going on here. We never, 200 years ago, uh, Mary Lou, this is, this is an inarguable truth. 200 years ago, we didn't even yet know we evolved. Right. So imagine the lack of any point of reference mm-hmm. whatsoever meant that every human group that came in contact with another prior to 200 years ago in their minds, they may have been aliens from outer space. Mm-hmm. So right away, we went into extremely tribal, paranoid behavior. Why? Because these are aliens from outer space. But no, who knew that we had come from the African Congo Basin on a journey that is now well understood, but was not understood in any way, even 200 years ago. So any human culture that came into um, existence that was stationary and that was commanded to acquire had no choice mathematically preordained to fail, not by its choices, but what, but, but by what it could never understand, but it darn well can now, can it? Okay, so we are blameless in our breakdowns. We don't understand ourselves in any way. And now we can, and we need to. Anybody wants to put a divine take on it, I'm apt to agree. If someone wants to make an, take it, uh, put another take on it, or a scientific one, a, a, an evolutionary one, I'm apt to agree also. But we have a common, something common we could all agree on. We are here. We are in crisis together. All 8 billion of us, we are all circling one drain. Never mind mm. your politics, never mind your religion, never mind your culture. There's one drain for all 8 billion of us. So we are here to unite every human being on this earth under the banner of species self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's doable. Okay. It's doable. I can tell. I mean, I can tell you're passionate about this. Your 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 explanation of what's really happening is is it really fascinating. And I'm sure listeners, uh, what you've shared today is, is new, is a new way of looking at what's really going on. And it's, it is easy to get caught up in, and I go back to Thoreau all the time in his work at Walden Pond, where he talked about, you know, if we spend all of our time dissecting every mosquito wing that comes across our path, we're missing the whole point. You know, we humans have this tendency and it, obviously stems from everything you've said today to, you know, major in the minors, you know, instead of looking at taking a step back and 
use the word divorcing ourselves from any kind of emotional attachment to circumstance and say, what, what is really going on? So for, for listeners who'd like to learn more about your work in Noesis, Tony, where, uh, where can they find some of these videos that you've done? Um, where do you hang out online? Um, thank you, uh, Mary Lou. Thank you very much. Um, we are humbled, very, very humbled uh, by a, a tremendous amount of attention and, and popularity. There's a timeliness to this. That's fair. There's a timeliness. I mean, you have people like looking around like, my God, look, we are a sentient species that doesn't know how we got here and doesn't know how we're leaving. And, and we're watching what we don't understand fall apart. My God, what could go wrong here? So uh, this, is, and this is not just a nonsense take. This is an empathic take on a, on a lost, very lost and blameless species. I mean, we got to get away from the self-loathing because it's choosing suicidal behavior as self-loathing mm-hmm. would. So right. um, we're at noesisproject.com. I'm really happy and really lucky to be on, on a, a podcast like this where I can just talk about it. It's one with several conversations at a time. It has an exponential effect. We are trying to, we're not the extinction guys. No, no. We're the non-extinction guys. Mm-hmm. We're trying to avoid the, what need not be the idea that we have to bottom out. It's preposterous. Why? We have data that we never, ever had. Let me ask all the viewers a question. Have you ever been to a sales meeting where you all decide to just let it go to seed? Oh, sales are down. Let's let it go to seed. We have to. Who's ever said that? <laughs> the same is true for the human race. Why do we have to bottom out to survive ourselves? I, I challenge that because of information we now have. We're of the mind and we'll figure it out. Mary Lou, we will not figure it out. We don't have the data to know ourselves. So noisesproject.com, there are multiple videos there. I made a, a lot of videos to put these thoughts in, into, into uh, educational videos about what's happening with us. What happened to us as opposed to look at this mess? What value do we bring? What happened to us? If you were a guidance counselor, anybody out there, and a student presented was acting out, withdrawal, getting into fights, we would go to their aid. What happened? What happened here? Hmm. What made you lose your sense of value in yourself? Why don't you value yourself? We would get busy finding it out. And we would find the reason, perhaps a divorce. Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. We would start there. We're starting with an entire human species acting suicidally that is innocent of its crimes. Mm. Mm. Wow. Boy. <laughs> That's an enormous and brave and co- courageous and fascinating and important uh, point of view to have, you know, it's. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. But let me, let me get a comical take here. People say, oh my God, doom and gloom. No, oh no, no, no. We have clarity now, don't we? Right. I promised clarity. Clarity is our friend, right? We are here for clarity and then to attack concerns that we now can view and what values itself will preserve itself rather than acting suicidally. The idea that we're acting suicidally as a species, duh, we don't like ourselves. That's that's reasonable. What doesn't like itself will choose suicidal behavior. So we're out on a ledge. It destroys itself. It destroys itself. We're out on a ledge and Luis is trying to talk us back in. What are you, what are you guilty of? Everything. Oh, no, you're not. We have other information that can show you you are guiltless. Well, that's when that person might come back in. And that's what we're trying to do here. Mm, wow. Well, Tony, the, I'm in, and again, I'm usually not a loss for words, but what you shared today is, is really thought provoking. And before we say goodbye, could you share a, a book or two that 
you have found uh, instrumental on the journey that you're on? Um, let me, yeah, let, let me answer it in, again, perhaps a little bit of a counterintuitive way. There's a lot of counterintuitive intuitive thinking going on here. I explained earlier that we're pounding one another about the head. Well, we're looking for negative information to die long ago. We get counterintuitive. We can look at it at a way different than what we think's going on. So what's counterintuitive about books? Well, I'm a learner. What, what, what makes me happy is learning. So I read everything I can get my hands on. My subject matters are diverse. I, 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 I do cosmology. Human rarity is another thing we're going to be doing. Teaching human beings their cosmic rarity. The idea that we're a Monet. Hmm. We're stepping over bodies in the streets. We think they made bad decisions. And we just think it's a Monet laying there. The most remarkable and rare species, perhaps in the galaxy. Hmm. We do human uh, rarity, uh, human rarity issues too. We have the Fermi paradox. The great filter explains our rarity. That which understands its rarity will value its rarity and preserve itself. We're going to do mm. anything we can to teach human beings that we are not just worth saving. Who we are is deserves deserves to survive. What we become cannot ever survive. We know that. So I don't really read books. I read everything else but books. Mm. I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a scientific mind who, dev- who then defaults to great empathy. Uh, like I just feel it all with great sadness. It's what we've done to ourselves and what we feel about ourselves. We don't deserve any of it. And your message is one of hope, ultimately. We have clarity. We're going to, as long as I'm drawing oxygen, Mary Lou, <laughs> we are, I'm going to go all over the world to unite human beings under the truth, who we are, it's knowable in great detail. Mm. There are three things we can't unite under politically, no, culturally, no, economically, even, you know, we're in a, we're an action reaction model of perpetual conflict. It feeds our children. What could go wrong here? It's going to have to reposition itself very slowly over time, decades and decades. While we can promise nothing, we can promise nothing, only a better chance to survive ourselves. So you'll hear me talking, but you'll also see me getting on a plane. We have a common enemy, do we not? And that is the mortality of our species. Well, on that note, I want to thank you again for taking time to share your, your work, your passion, your history. And giving us all something really profound to think about. Never had a conversation like this one before. And and I appreciate it tremendously because you are doing important work. And I wish you continued success, Tony, as you do go around the world and help our species unite. Thank you. May I end with a a final thought? Sure. Go to uh, LuisaProject.com. From here, you know. I'm thinking, anybody else, I'm thinking like, hey, I'm going to go to the Noise Front, and it better be good. Because you know why? Human beings no longer enjoy the luxury of thought, of, of, of uh, theory. Mary Lou, we're, we're scared. We're frightened. We need answers. Uh, and we're acting every bit of it. So um, go there and take us to task. Go look at everything. There is an, there is an intelligence and a continuity here that must be in place or we will lose you, right? If you're going to do what I do, you better have things in order to capture and keep people captive to the message as opposed to nonsense. You will not find nonsense. So thank you very much for the ability to to uh, impart this message and for the very nice things that you said. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year? Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills... 
They never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. PYPpodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's PYPpodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at PYPpodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. 